Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time it's a Stabby Lock 4040. It's a complete radio communication test setup system. It will do anything you can imagine and a little bit more than that, I think. All in one nice compact unit. <laughs> well, it's not that super compact. But compared to having 20 or 30 other different units to do different kind of things, I mean, then it is defin uh, definitely uh, quite compact. It's about uh, 21 kilos and it uses 85 watts and it's from uh, 1994. It's full of microprocessors and software and all sorts of cool things. So um, I really hope it works. Before I go and power this up for the first time, I also want to inspect the the rear side. I haven't actually had a stabby lock before, so it's going to be a lot of fun to try and figure out all the different uh, test test sets you can do here. You can just see all the different sets and you turn them on and off and uh, do all that kind of stuff here. And look at that, down here, oops, is a little tape recorder. Those super tiny compact tapes, cassette tapes. And this is of course for storing and recording and auto test playback. It's really, really funny. They made a mechanical storage system here where you can add all your setups and file this and file that learn then you do a lot of stuff and then it's you can play back you know i think it's absolutely fantastic i <laughs> can't wait to see if that works but i don't know if i will be able to find a tape for that it will do all sorts of modulation full um level meters and uh, all that kind of stuff as well and it will do um Receivers and transmitters, and you can, yeah. TX counter. Okay, so we'll test uh, your TX frequency, and it can, of course, generate frequencies. This one will, um, yeah, cover from 0.4 to 960 megahertz. Let's look at the rear side and see how impressive it is. And here is the rear side. So maybe that will be all the options. We've got the cassette recorder, IEC bus interface, AD something, duplex, all sorts of things. So if there's a frequency, if there really, really is a frequency doubler, then this one should go to two gigahertz and not just 960, right? So I don't know if that is installed or not. Maybe there should be a little tick mark here if stuff is installed or not. Well, we can't see any of those, but it definitely got the cassette recorder. Yes, there is a fan, and this is the power supply module. We can plug this out, and uh, of course it can run off all the normal standard voltages, but there's another really, really cool thing about this unit. It can run on 12 volts or even 24. So there is a wide input switch mode converter here as well. Well, it's actually full of switch mode converters, and that's another deal with the power supply in this one. First, there is a conventional power supply, and then we got four main switch mode power supplies, making all sorts of voltages and and stuff. And since this is from '94, it's probably full of capacitors that needs to be replaced. So that's also very interesting. And we got all the different uh, plug-in modules here for different things. And they're all screwed good and nicely in here. And this one, so it looks like a band pass 4 kilohertz. And this one is a little bit loose. It looks like it's almost falling out. So maybe it's supposed to be like that. So let's just uh, power it up and see if it uh, works or not. So I just plugged in mains supply. And there is actually a, let me turn this off so you can see, there's actually a an LED here that saying says line or battery, so that means we got input uh, to the main 
transformer and the main system here is uh, running. It is using about six watts uh, of idle. So here goes nothing. Uh. <laughs> here goes exactly nothing. Hello! Why do you do that? No way! That sucks! Let me turn off mains again. And let me turn it on again. No! That is not good! Maybe it's just a fuse or something, but... Nah, okay. I'll be back. This is not funny. Fuse is intact. Damn it. So far so good. We are in. And of course the first thing I see is this uh, Schlumberger uh, name here. So of course Stappy Lock is a registered trademark of uh, Schlumberger. So that is something we all know. And then the power supply is a very very big heavy module. So I got that one out. And then I think it is, should be possible to power this up all by itself and see if we got any voltages or anything good coming out of this fantastic module. Probably. Oh, I already see some evidences of some acid damages here, right? I don't know if you can see this. Yep. So I will have to open this and see where it is. We should have some uh, switch mode power supplies in here, and then we should have a traditional power supply. Uh, here we go. Of course, look at the wet slime that's coming out of the holes here. And I did, of course, uh, try and touch this and smell it, but it don't smell like capacitor acids. Well, I think we should have a look. I am now inside the power supply and it is absolutely super, super beautiful. It consists of four different modules. It looks a little bit like this. Then we got those little top metal pieces here. Funny enough, there is one missing for the last one. I only got four of these. No, it's here. It is sticky. So it was here. Okay, so that is where the last one was and they're symmetric okay so that is good but look here at the top i don't know if you can see yes you can probably see this with a little bit of luck you can see we got some slimy sticky goobity goop coming out of something right and i guess some of those capacitors here they are they leaked and uh i need to figure out exactly which ones and then I also release removed the four screws here at the top so that means this whole unit is now possible to lift up so yeah I think definitely there is a power supply problem here we can't have all sorts of liquids and but it doesn't really smell that bad so that is a, a little bit odd normally you, there's a special special smell from capacitors they actually made it real service friendly. See this unit here? You can easily unscrew the switch mode power supplies. And then that will be the DC that comes in from the rectifiers and diodes and stuff like that. And there's of course the DC input from this down there. The DC input connector. That also goes via the diodes here and all that kind of stuff. So that's of course easy peasy DC input. And then the other side of this unit, if I flip it down real careful, so all the outputs, you can see the four individual filters, but all the different uh, output voltages, there's probably another little output voltage there. It goes down to this connector that goes into the unit and see all we have to do is take out those two screws and then this board is loose so we should definitely be able to service this quite easy 
We also got two little, the blue and the red thin wires here. They are for the fan power supply or a fan converter or some kind of fan stuff here. Because look at that, we got four wires to the fan. So that is a synchronous uh, or AC kind of motor. So that is nice, good for a long service. So there will be some electronics and stuff in that one. But I see uh, two connectors here, so I can just pull out the the blue and the red one. There's the little board I was talk talking about. I actually see three screws, but I also see three other wires from the rectifier and main capacitors. So what are they doing? And here I see... What is this? It's not called red here. But GN is probably green, right? Hmm. Okay, well, that's how it is. Better remember how to do this so I can put it back together, right? So this is the back side of the power supply. The four switch mode power supplies. And look at all those screws. So it's not only a super good thermal design, but it's also a very, very good EMC correct design what they're doing here. They definitely know what they're doing. This is a very, very beautiful switch mode power supply. Oh, man, it is nice. Multi-layer board and everything is just super, super shielded. I must say I am a little bit impressed. That is a good build quality. So before I spend a lot of time repairing the power supply, I was actually thinking maybe it's possible to figure out how many voltages we got here and all that, and maybe simulate all those power supplies and then see if the rest of the unit works. Because if that works, I am much more motivated to fix the power supply. I mean, I, mean, I think that is a good uh, way to divide and conquer. Right, we got the four output modules. I took up one of them. They're more or less identical. So we got a little op amp and a little trimmer, probably for the voltage and uh, some transistors. And uh, look at this little pin that's sticking out here. We've got four different possibilities to put that pin, right? So that means you can't swap them because this pin will go through this hole. So only this module will fit here. So you can take them all out and repair them and all that kind of stuff, but you can't put them back wrong. And this PCB here was all wet by this acid stuff. So I wanted to try and take out those two capacitors and test how bad they are because this is where it was most wet and sticky. So, I desolder those two capacitors, because in this room, I had this slimy, and look at that, that capacitor definitely puked, but it's not, like, really, really bad, it's not like that, and then I started to smell a little bit more, and it doesn't really smell so much like capacitors, it smells a little bit more like transistors, so look what I found. How about that one? This is not so good. So I guess this is a half bridge push pull and that will be the transformer and that will be the diodes or probably synchronous uh, rectifier. I don't know if it's like that. And then we got inductor, filter, and inductor, filter and all that kind of stuff and filter a little inductor and a more filter. So they're really doing everything super, super nice, but definitely that is not good. So that is probably why it refuses to start up. And there's probably a more like a main power on or main failure thing that prevents this unit from running when it is really that much blown up. This is day two of the Stappy Lock experiments. 
And this is where the power supply is mounted. I followed the different uh, colors and wires uh, from the power supply. And here is um, how it works. The four different uh, power supplies, they go in like this. And we got a thick and a thin wire on each of these. And that is, of course, the power and then the sense. So voltage sense is all the way down into the main board and then back to the power supply. So it will regulate exactly where the power is needed. And that is because the 5.2 is actually 6 amps. 5.5 uh, .5 is uh, 2.7 amps and plus 15 is 2 amps minus 15 that will be 1.6 amps and that is a total of 100 watts output from the power supply so that is the power supply's maximum uh, limits or maximum specifications uh, this whole unit is rated 85 watts so i expect the power usage out of the power supply will be about 50 60 watts or something like that a lot lower and uh, now i can see this is the rear side of this micro cassette drive so that is a little plug-in module that is kind of the drive and this pcb looks like it's from a different vendor so this is something they just bought and then just plug in this little data storage unit super nice it's also a little bit funny to see a beeper and a speaker why not combine those two things so the beep beep things goes out of the speaker i mean that is a little bit funny isn't it i think that will be relays of some sort maybe i don't know yet but my I, my goal for today is to try and uh, power the the stapilock by uh, feeding in all those voltages and see if the rest of the unit seems to be okay because you know repairing the the power supply is is going to be uh, either a lot of wasted time or a lot of invested time depending on how the rest works or not right so this is going to be my first power up of this entire unit powered up by four external power supplies like that chassis is uh, the return so i can just connect everything to chassis and this is what i've done individual connections to chassis so if one of them gets loose i'm not going to to kill anything here so this will be the 5.2 and on, on, and on. And that is all the power supplies. And what have we got here? We have a problem. Definitely. The 15 volts is pulling way too much power. So I will turn this off. Why are you saying beep, beep, beep? But, see that it was a problem, a plus 15. This was only supposed to be uh, using 2 amps. So now it's running on plus 5.5, there's only 1 amp. And uh, that is a 2.7 amp uh, maximum requirement. And the 5.2 is 2.3 amps. But the unit appears to be a little bit alive. At least we got we got some responses, but of course I am not I did not expect anything to work because of the missing uh, plus fifteen. I'm not too happy about this. Is not good. So there's a shorted capacitor in the plus fifteen that one we need to find okay i am still hunting down the shorted 15 volts so what i'm doing is i'm pulling out all the plug-in modules first and i mean i think this will be all the different options that you can 
that you can have, right? Ooh, what is that? That is a pin that is not correctly into the socket. Hmm. But anyway, I still have a short on the 15 volts with all those out. So I think I need to take out the next big module as well. So now I'm going to hunt down that 15 volt overload shorted thingy. And here in the middle, there's this aluminium cover uh, full of screws and all that kind of stuff and remember to take away the two screws here near those two bnc connectors and then the modules they're actually color coded like that so you don't plug them in wrong i would also expect the connectors down there to be coded or something like that right ah we also got the colors down here so that should be pretty good Ah, I was just yelling and screaming. Ha <laughs> ha! I pulled out one of those modules and then I turned on the 15 volts. And it's just short, short, short. Oh, now the short is gone. So it's this module. It's the green module. Whew, because I was super afraid it would be on the back panel here and it's full of annoying things. This is kind of impossible to get in there, right? So. What a lucky day. Let's see what's in the green module. Well, immediately when I pulled out the green module, I can now see capacitor puke right here. And there was a terrible smell from this module. So definitely we found it, the smelly one. We are now inside the green module. And this one is called a decayed synthesizer it says here so it is and it's actually a little bit smelly smelly in here and if I look a little bit here I kind of know this type of capacitor is a known nightmare and also that one but it can't be that one because this one is on 10 volts or it's rated 10 volt. This one is also rated on 10 volt. So that's funny. It just can't be that because it's a 15 volt problem, right? But if I look at the top of this one, it is actually cracked. And I see, let me see if I can get it. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's actually uh, cracked and we see a little bit of wet stuff coming out of that one so definitely it's a good idea to to fix that problem and here's also a capacitor that's a little bit funny with the color and this one is rated 35 volts so i think i will just try and uh, desolder one of them at a time and then plug the module in and power it up and see uh, where it was. I was about getting ready for desoldering the capacitors or the big electrolytics one by one. And then I put on my good soldering glasses and have a little better look. And then we see this thingy here. What do you call that? That can't be good. So I think that is the short i think i'm gonna cut one of the pins to that one and then try my lock again what kind of lock is that so that's the green module it's in and i plugged in all the other four modules here and power it up and 15 volts is now perfectly fine so i'm definitely uh going to plug in all the other modules and uh, power it up again and hopefully get it to uh, to work I'm just looking at the different uh, modules. IF unit. It's just so, so beautiful, this design. I really wanted to share with you how nice that is. It's also full of text explanation about 
what have we got here? Voltages and signals, IC numbers and all that kind of stuff. They don't really using silk screen, but they're using the top copper layer here to put in the text. So this is definitely super, super well designed. I love it. And you see the Motorola 6821. Isn't that just a port expander uh, chip, All right? This is just my first guess. And then we got all sorts of analog and digital and all that kind of stuff interfacing uh, on a bus. I don't, I don't know if there is any rules about where you plug in stuff here, because as you see down here, the bus uh, plane here is just one parallel thing. So, but I will put in modules exactly where they were originally and that one goes here. Here is module number seven and it is the modulation generator and again they're using 6821 so I think it's some sort of a parallel serial interface port expander thingy because it's again on this bus and that will be a line driver for this uh, the bus and then there is a sign table and analog conversion right here we go 8-bit analog conversion for that sign table and some op amps and some more analog stuff that goes to yeah that definitely and a little bit of local power supply for all that analog goody goody stuff. And again, the capacitors, look at that. You see they're cracked in the top and you see they're, especially the one in the middle of the picture right now, it's wet on the top here. And this one says 25 volts. So this is also on the 15 volt rail. So those two needs to be changed as well. And I will definitely recommend going through all boards and exactly this brand all of them replace all of them before we continue i definitely need to do something about the cracked and leaked ones here this is a module number eight it's called the microcomputer and the iec bus interface and here is a an optional or an upgradable IEC bus interface with a little flat cable connector and all that and look at all those EEPROMs so that's the software and here is the CPU is 6802 running at 4 megahertz here is a battery Backup battery 2.4 volts. There's probably some diodes and some charge and some stuff here for that. And what we've got here, that will be static RAM for the backup system. So that is how it is. I think I will try and measure the voltage on that battery. Yeah, 0 0.6 volt on the battery. And that switch here is actually battery voltage so i guess if you take this on and off you can clear the settings but that one is also a source of leakage and sort source of problems but now i'll see what happens and uh, now i know i can pull this out when it's been running for a few hours and let's see if there's a voltage uh, coming into this cell or something like that here is module number nine this one looks like a very special custom plug-in board, right? Because look at that. It relay board. It's made... Oh, let me... Vestula Telecom AS91. I mean, this is definitely super, super special. And nothing here is looking like the, or all the other boards, right? So that will be a relay output board for all sorts of automatic tests 
and stuff like that. How cool is that? So that's probably also some special firmware in this unit to support those uh, features. And this PCB is just a normal two-layer board. The layout of this board is definitely not looking as professional as all the other boards. So there's a clear difference in the in the layout, the style, the quality, and everything like that. A big difference. Really? I mean, look at that. When do you go straight? When do you do 90 degrees and all that kind of stuff? It's just completely random. And look at the distance to that via, to that track. is just zero isolation distance. Not good at all. I saw that here on the, another one here on the top. Exactly the same problem. So the guy who did this layout did not run a proper design rule check. How oh, funny. So this is plug-in unit 10 and 11. So they are mounted together 10 and 11. So you can't really do anything wrong here. But all capacitors on 10 and 11 here they leaked and uh, they created a little bit of acid damage as well. You can actually see it here on the PCB. You can see acid damage. Yeah. And over here, you can even see the rings around this capacitor completely leaked, starting to corrode cause all sorts of damage to the analog circuits here. So those two boards need a complete capacitor replacement. You can totally see it here. See the green corrosion on the parts and on everything here. This is just a sad, sad sight. This will take a few days to go through all those capacitors and do a deep, deep clean of both both of the boards here. But luckily it's quite all right with the mechanical design here and this board to board interface here. It is, as long as the first board here is removed, then you get nice access to everything. So. So definitely it's possible, but yeah, you can see it's completely corroded all over the place. That is by far the worst one I have seen so far. So now the unit is up and running. Uh, it's actually not using that much power. So here's my 5.2 volts, 2 amps. 5.5 volts is uh, almost 1 amp, and that will be the plus minus 15. So that is all not a lot, really. So the unit is definitely alive, and uh, you can input stuff, and you can poke around with this. I figured out that frequency here, then this one lights up, and then I can put in 93 megahertz and then it goes 93 megahertz if i push okay i don't know why do i is this not working just before i played with this i could just move the cursor and then i could dial in frequencies i don't know let's try again i put in frequency one on no Ah, that is the problem. Now. Yeah, here we go. So I had a sticky switch. So I can go here. What, what is the... Where is the... Hmm, I don't know. And uh, so that will be frequency. Amplitude. Frequency. Modulation. And it's responding. 
you know, to all sorts of things here. So the unit is definitely a live. Uh, this unit also contains uh, some self-test uh, features. As far as I remember, all you have to do is push special and then 31. And then it will run some self-test. Uh, Self-check next. And we got an error in U4. Or is this just error number 41 or 4.1? I don't know. You can next. When I was powering it up for, uh, before, I, I ran the cell test like this. Sorry about that noise. And then it stops here. So that's definitely a, a self-check problem. So there's a lot more to go through here. Well, 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 the unit is definitely alive. Listen to this. You can hear this. It's coming from that connector here. Just put it for a VHF channel. And then I can play with modulation and all that kind of stuff. Ooh, that is variable. So that's 15. So that will be the... Oh, yeah. So that is the frequency. Variable generator. I don't understand that. That is not working. Well, well. And also the unit is full of all sorts of errors. I ran through uh, the different self-checks. And uh, when you're performing a self-test, te uh, you can just hit the plus button. Then it will continue to the next test. And then it's going to relist all the different errors on the display. So yeah, it's definitely full of uh, all sorts of errors that needs to be addressed. But I think it's going to be fun to see if uh, we can fix the power supply now. I got good news. A lot of progress to report. <laughs> that is so cool. So that's, of course, the four switch mode power supplies. And I got one of them up and running. So this is the one with the blown up transistors. And of course, those transistors also killed the switch mode controller. And also, it destroyed some of the parts inside this one, the 4093. So that's just some gates to handle um, shutdown and slow start. If we look at this um, schematic snip, of um, one of the power supplies. This is actually the top one. And this is the master oscillator controller. And then the, the output from that oscillator is uh, driving uh, the three other. So they're running in perfect phase with the same frequencies. And um, I took the controller chip from this one, one is number three. Because three and four, they work. So those two controllers, they work. So I just took all of this out of the sockets and uh, I tested one by one. So here I get oscillations and I get the drive and I get the output and all that kind of stuff. And uh, here's how easy it is to boot this up. The thin red wire, that is the on-off uh, signal. All you have to do is uh, connect this to your positive input. And uh, the nominal voltage is uh, 23 volts. So this is what I input. So let's try and uh, crank on the 23 volts. This is actually the idle power, 0 0.7 watts for one converter that is ru uh, running like this. And the, the output of this converter, I just took this uh, cable here to one of my loads. And here we go, 5.2 volts, exactly as it's supposed to be. 
So what we can do is just go in here, just enable three amps. Oops. So that's uh, three amps, 15 uh, watts of outputs. And then this is the input, 22 watts of uh, input. So there's of course a uh, lot of watts lost. And since this is a low voltage converter and it's using uh, conventional diodes here in the rectifier, and that is the inductor here at the output, right? So of course the diodes at the secondary side is what is going to be the hottest. I've added a little bit of paint here so I can measure the temperatures on the diode or on this little isolator plate and on the cooling aluminium. You see the big screws here, so this is connected to the big fat aluminium plates at the top and at the bottom. The same here with the primary side. I actually think it's, uh, it's better if, if we show this on the blown up primary side. So that will be the two blown up transistors. So what I want to show you is underneath the transistors, I don't know if you can see this, but there's actually a little piece of metal, a thin, thin sheet of uh, metal. And then there's another isolation. And then we got the cooling aluminum, right? So that piece of metal here is connected to the primary side noise return loop. And the, the cooling is connected to the output chassis. So by doing this, there is normally a capacitive connection between the drain and then the heatsink, right? And since they didn't really handle snooping really good, there, there aren't really any snooper circuits here. So, so the FETs and, and the inductance and all that kind of stuff here, it actually oscillates at 27 megahertz. Every time uh, there is a transition, we get this uh, 27 megahertz uh, ring. And this uh, would have gone directly into chassis currents. And chassis currents is something that is really, really difficult to handle in a radio test equipment. You don't want chassis currents. And this is why they couple all the high frequency pulses to a special return loop that kind of loops everything perfectly together in the primary side. So they avoid AC high frequency currents into the chassis. So that is a little bit special. Uh, I've seen a little bit like this before, but uh, I think it's smarter just to add snoopers. <laughs> so you can just uh, slow down all those uh, transients. So another thing uh, what they we can learn from this schematic is inside the transformer. So I said this is a half uh, bridge, a half uh, bridge um, push-pull. So the center point here is your positive supply, right? And then it goes to the two halves with the push-pull. So that one here is a current transformer. It's not so easy to understand, but there's just only one tiny little winding here on the primary current. And then there's a lot of windings here. So that will be the current output. And then it's rectified. And then we can measure the current. So when the current uh, rises, the voltage goes up here, and then it actually uses the slow start input to turn off the current. So that here you have your overcurrent uh, regulation or protection for overload. And that actually also works perfectly fine. This is um, the shutdown, and this is the on-off. Uh, as well as uh, the temperature. So there's a temperature sensor and uh, when this voltage gets too high it shuts down this converter and uh, this signal just, just goes to the next and to the next and to the next so you can do the same. Those um, ICs here, the 4093s, they are powered off the VREF 
and that is a 5.1 volt um, high accuracy voltage that comes out of uh, the switch mode converter and uh, that is used also to power supply that individual IC. So of course if you pull out those ICs and you don't have those supplies or if you have a, like a defect uh, switch mode controller you have something here that's not um, that's like loading the different signals and you also have uh, signals here that's loading all the parallel uh, signals for example the oscillator output and the, um, the ramp and also the shutdown the over temperature shutdown so those ICs need to work otherwise everything here is gonna look like defect so that's also something that was a uh, a little bit annoying, uh, delayed me a little bit before I could uh, solve this uh, problem. So here it is, the converter on the with the thermal camera, and of course you can see the secondary side is a lot hotter. Look at that, it's 50 Celsius, and the primary side is what 30, 40. So it's a lot hotter and there's actually a lot more metal here and it's still a lot warmer we also see the transformer let me take out my macro that will allow us to take a nice close-up of the diodes So that is how it looks. And let's see on the the primary side here. This looks all right. What you want to look for is one of them is a lot hotter than the other one. And that is because those screws, they're getting loose. You know, that's the driver transistor. What is that up there? Oh, that's just a reflection. I went through the screws on the other transistors here and they were more or less loose. So that's maybe what killed this. It was an over temperature because of the screws were getting loose. See this one blew up, but the other one is quite loose. All right, see? Of course there's no thermal connection when this is loose. It's also really stupid to use a uh, plastic screw or a nylon screw like this when you've got good aluminium to screw in like that. You can, if you use those little nylon isolation hats to be, put in here between here and then use a metal screw, it's going to stay much more stable. But I think I'm going to put in some new field effect transistors here. So they are called uh, BUZ20, and they're very close to RF530. Uh, and I, of course, I have happened to have a few of those on stock. So what I want to do is, I got one more IC that is working. So my goal is to put in those transistors here and get the next converter up and running because then I have proven that it's possible to get this up and running and then I can just move between the different outputs and then prove that I got all of them up and running. See when the FETs are in here I need to hold the gates low when the ICs are not in here because there are no resistors or anything here in the circuit. Not even a serious resistor there's uh, no control of uh, rise time, fall time, or any anti-ringing things here. So, of course, this is not super smart. With a resistor, uh, or like two resistors and one with a diode, you can control the on-off uh, rise and fall times. And, of course, if you add snobbers, uh, you can also control all the ringing. You can get a much better EMC solution out of this. So, here it is ready mm, for mounting 
This is how I think it should have been. With metal screws and this little nylon isolator here at the top. And here down below you see the the shielding. Good news and I got bad news. <laughs> So that is the next converter. That is the one with the blown up FETs. And here's what I did. Yeah, of course I changed the FETs and changed this capacitor and all that kind of stuff. And I know the parts around here, they're all perfectly fine. So when I enable, see now my idle power is 15. And I got 5.5 volts output. So that one is, I got voltage and it's regulating and all that kind of stuff. But there is a symmetric problem inside the transformer. Ooh, and it is getting burning, burning hot. And you know what? When, when those transistors, they blew up in the good old days, I think they actually killed the transformer in here. You see? If one of those transistors completely shorts, you can see that it can melt down the transformer windings and all that kind of stuff. So that means this transformer, is, and it's a very, very special one, right? I can't change this. I can't get a spare part for this. So, I mean, this power supply is working, but you can't load it at all because then it's going to go absolutely bungus. Damn it, that is annoying. So that is a total, total stop for the repair of this power supply as it is. But there is one more way out of this problem because it's actually super easy to get 15 volts and 5 volts uh, switch mode power supplies and then trim them to 5.2 and 5.5 and just put them into this space down here, right? because we've got plenty of space. We've also got a lot of space to put in EMC filters and all that kind of stuff. So yes, it is definitely possible to fix this unit and still get a working stabby lock out of it. <laughs> it is not going to be um, in this video. <laughs> it's going to be in a later one. So I think I will call it a day and end this video for now. So thank you very much for watching and have a good day. See you tomorrow. Bye.